All right, all right, all right. Uh, the, our keynote this morning is someone you probably all know. Uh, uh, Amanda Berlin is the uh, author of the Defensive Security Handbook, uh, world-renowned author, uh, Guinness Book of World Records holder for the largest game of Pong ever played at Code Mash. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all around amazing person, uh, trampoline expert. I'm sure you don't know that, but trampoline expert. Um, so Amanda's going to uh, give us a talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, obviously. Amanda's going to give us a, a amazing keynote here about uh, hackers, hugs, and drugs. Uh, everybody give a round of, uh, a round of applause uh, to Amanda. She's an amazing speaker and a fun friend to have. Excuse me while I like hobble over here. Yes, tra uh, trampoline expert. I was uh, professionally trampolining in my backyard. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm on crutches. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so welcome to Converge. This is great. This is, what, what year of Converge is this? Like 20 year? Oh, four. All right. Year four, <laughs> Converge. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about mental health, which nobody likes to talk about, right? So um, I want to start out in, uh, with a little bit of a story. Uh, about, well, about eight years now, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I was married, had two kids, uh, living in a really really shitty town in a really shitty house. Um, my second son was about uh, a year old and my oldest was seven. Our roof leaked, um, there was like mold in the house and animals running everywhere and it was just absolutely horrible. So without going into too much detail of the marriage itself, um, I didn't really have any control at the time of what happened in my life or my children's life. Um, <clears throat> I remember the one night that something that like something actually clicked and I realized something was wrong with me. Um, I was in the shower, just had gotten out and like broke down on the floor sobbing. Couldn't speak. This is exactly how I felt. Like everything in my head was static. Like I couldn't physically speak. It's not like I didn't want to talk. It's, I, it, it physically hurt to think of any coherent thought. After I calmed down about an hour later, um, I realized what kind of had triggered it, and it was that my shower curtain was dirty. Stupidest thing ever um, at the time, right? It just seemed it, really immature that I should break down for an hour over something that tiny. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Is this going? Maybe not. There we go. Um, so looking back at all of that now, a lot of the anxiety problems that I had, and at the time I didn't know it was anxiety, um, were because of that lack of control and just the dirt and just, it just drove me crazy. Now I live in a great house and it's clean and other than not being able to do much cleaning now, um, you know, I, I realized that that was one thing that really tripped off my anxiety. Um, but I thought at the time, too, like once I realized that, that I can handle all of this on my own. Like I've never been able to um, uh, not overcome a problem that I had been faced by myself. You know, teen pregnancy, whatever, I, I just did it, right? I never really asked for any help. And, you know, I was at the ripe old age of 25. I shouldn't have all the answers myself, right? So why in the world am I bringing this up at Information Security Conference? Um, one, because I consider this, like this is our community, I consider a lot of you my family, <clears throat> more so than a lot of the blood relatives that I have. Uh, this has been the first group of people that have truly understood me, like either being bullied when, I've, when growing up or the anxiety problems that I have, all that kind of stuff. When I began tweeting, posting stuff on Facebook, you wouldn't believe the amount of people that showed up um, like in my DMs and at conferences just talking to me about the same kind of struggles that they had. So I thought I would go ahead and put a bunch of research behind that and see if um, the trend that I was seeing had any you know, actual doctors looking into it. <clears throat> um, a lot of people also struggle and struggle alone like I did for the good part of 10 years. And those are the kind of people that look like they have it together, 
Um, just like everybody's super surprised when you say you're depressed and they're like, oh, but you're always happy and laughing and whatever. Um, so looking back at my life after I finally got some help, I'd been struggling since my teens, um, and it had gotten progressively worse, but it was always there and always will be. Uh, we never want to admit anything's wrong with us, right? And what's the first step to almost any 12-step program? The admitting you have a problem, right? Accepting it. Um, but if you accept it and stop there, it's just going to make you more angry and depressed, and it's not really going to do anything. You can't just accept there's a problem. You have to accept that you need help uh, in one form or another. And that's what I finally did after 10 years. Uh, not do, not um, only do people in our industry have the normal stresses of like an everyday job. I mean, you have life stress, money stress, all that kind of stuff kind of building on top of each other. But all of us are extremely passionate about what we do. Uh, it's not just a nine to five job anymore. This is our career, our passion, our hobby. Um, none of you are none of you are here because you have to be. At least I hope not. <laughs> Otherwise, this would be really depressing. Um, uh, the, in, the InfoSec community is really hard to compare to any other. Um, we put stress on ourselves in form of research, learning, teaching, um, build our younger careers, and you know we take it from our bosses, our family, you know all those external entities as well. And a majority of our roles cater to the fact that we like to sit behind a computer and not talk to anybody. <laughs> um, I know mine does. I have to force myself to leave the house to interact with people. Um, and then you can add to that roles like incident response or any type of law enforcement role that has to do with child trafficking or abuse cases, any of that OSINT that goes around that. Um, and and you know, if you're, um, uh, depending on what level of clearance you have, you might not be able to ever talk to anybody about it. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit of the research I was able to do next. Uh, when I first thought about talking about this topic, I went to Google and searched mental health issues in STEM fields. And most of them were about women. <laughs> so after removing women from the search, it took it from 6 million articles down to 2 million. Uh, and when it comes to mental illness, illness, really the sexes are different, right? Women are more likely to suffer from anxiety or depression, and men tend towards uh, substance abuse and antisocial disorders. But of course, nobody ever wants to talk about the men, even though they make up 70% of our industry. And really looking at the crowd, it's like 95%. <laughs> Uh, but the hypothesis I was trying to make is that it seems like people in STEM have a higher rate of mental health issues, at least from the feedback I was getting from people. Which turns out there's a few studies that prove this, um, and I read way more medical journals than I ever thought I would in my life. Um, the first one is the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis, uh, which I have a quote from. It states, uh, the finding of an association between progressively increasing risk of bipolar disorder and high arithmetic intellectual performance is rather surprising. Um, they explain that uh, arithmetic tests not only take um, mathematical skills and rapid information processing, um, and then they, uh, what else did they say? Oh, high scores in that field um, with such rapid processing power may also share a tendency to experience mania and a high state of focus and psychomotor activity. So this, this entire study that's just based on people in STEM and the fact that you're more likely to be messed up. Uh, so the Savannah IQ also talks about people with higher intelligence tending to self-medicate, uh, medicate with alcohol, drugs, more than the average person. Um, it kind of shows how much research the uh, writers of Mr. Robot put into it. So how many of you have watched Mr. Robot? Right? It's a great show. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend. Um, but without any spoilers, uh, <clears throat> the main character, Elliot, actually microdoses uh, with morphine, right, to keep himself sane. Uh, and then he uses um, Suboxone to kind of like take him down from it, from any with withdrawal he might experience. 
So I, I don't recommend that in a professional capacity at all. Uh, it's a basically a good gist of the part of that paper. <coughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so let's move on to some more statistics. Uh, not only does the Savannah IQ talk about the smarts to depression correlation, um, but there was also a recent study done at Berkeley that showed that um, between 42 and 48 percent of Berkeley PhD candidates suffered from depression, suffer from depression, and that's compared to 7 percent of the normal population. So, which makes sense in the Google results. There were significantly more results involving women because one, we report it more, and two, people are more likely to focus on my minorities. Um, I don't want to try and focus on men in this talk, but I mean, technically you're the minority in this case, you're not reporting it as much. Um, so, what did I say? It's not like you guys are not having issues. I know a lot of you. <laughs> uh, men are just reporting it less. Um, so I know this is the U.S., um, and this, what I found out is I gave this talk uh, in New Zealand last year, and this didn't really matter to them, right? <laughs> um, but what, what I wanted to point out with this is that I, I'm not really sure if it's, yeah, this is, these are U.S. numbers, but is it, you know, we live in, you know, a fairly all right, country, right, depending on your views. Um, you know, we're able to come here without anybody shooting at us, for the most part. Um, but is it, uh, is it just us? Is it the rest of the world that's like that? I, I, I don't really know. I wasn't able to find a whole lot on um, other countries. Um, all of this, and we think that everybody kind of has it together better than we do ourselves. I know I'm guilty of it. Um, a hand of pe handful of people have already done talks and research on imposter syndrome, and that can go hand in hand with mental health as well. Um, so imposter syndrome, if nobody knows uh, what it is or if you have it, either way, um, it's the feeling that uh, you don't belong here because you don't know enough or you've not, you don't have the right certifications or you don't have the right background or why are these people paying me this money to do what I don't think is worth this kind of money or I'm never going to make it in this field because I don't know all of these things. All of that leads to, all of that is imposter syndrome um, and a lot of us, a lot of us suffer from that constantly. Um, sometimes more more than others. Every time somebody asks me to give a keynote, I'm like, I have no idea why they want me up there talking. Um, you feel like you're drowning, and everyone around you kind of just has their shit together. Um, I know I can think of a lot of people that have talked me through situations like this, um, as well as all of the times that I've been limited because of my brain deciding to go in some crazy direction. <clears throat> Um, I found where the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends that all adults be screened for depression, which is astound astounding to think of. Um, when I read that, my mind went back to the whole U.S. thing, right? Is it really just U.S. citizens? Is it because of um, our first world problems? Uh, honestly, our government probably doesn't have a doesn't help a whole lot in that aspect, um, but. In the grand scheme of things, we don't really have it that bad, but that doesn't really matter when you're like huddled on the floor in a crying mess because that's just you. I mean, that has absolutely nothing to do with, um, you know, any of the stuff that's going on in the world. <clears throat> so I'm going to dive into the different types of mental health issues and their characteristics. Um, I'm not going to cover everything because that would take all day, but I'll cover some of the more common ones. Uh, when I talk about the symptoms of the diseases, pay attention. They don't just include all of the stuff going on in your head, but it's also a lot of physical manifestations of that kind of stuff. So first there's social anxiety disorder or general anxiety disorder, which I definitely, definitely have. Um, fear of situations where you might be judged, like standing up on stage in front of everybody, worrying about embarrassing or humiliating yourself, like calling 911 because you're on a trampoline, um, <laughs> concern that you'll offend people, 
um, intense fear of interacting with strangers. Like I said, it's very difficult for me to get out of the house when I'm by myself. Like with the kids, it's different because I can I can focus all of my energy and attention on them, and I don't really have to talk to anybody. <laughs> um, you avoid things or speaking to people out of fear of embarrassment um, and avoiding situations where you might be the center of attention. Uh, you have anxiety in anticipation um, of a uh, future activity or event. Like on the way here, I was just super nauseous. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that, uh, like when I when I did go to New Zealand, like I'm always worried that I'll be annoying people or wrong because you know, like I'm very you're very out of your element. So you know how. And here, when you're like walking down the aisle of a grocery store, you, you, con well, I do anyways, maybe because I'm crazy, but I consciously make an effort to walk like I'm driving, right? You walk on the right hand side of the road, of the aisle, just like you drive on the right hand side of the road. I did the opposite when I was in New Zealand, just because I was freaked out that that's what they did and they were going to see me on the wrong side and everybody was going to know I was an American because I was walking on the wrong side of the, of the sidewalk. Um, so you might say that a lot of these things happen to you every now and then, but all of these things specify that they're intense fears. Um, I know I'm not a doctor, but if you experience any of these, any of the symptoms, blah, 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 and if you haven't gotten help, it wouldn't hurt to do so. I have a whole end of the presentation to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, you might avoid normal social situations using public restrooms. I had a friend that I used to work with that... Um, couldn't eat in front of people. She wouldn't go out to lunch with us. She wouldn't eat in the cafeteria. She, if she couldn't eat at her desk, that was like turned away from people because she didn't want to see that they. She didn't want to see them. Uh, sorry, she didn't want them to see her chewing and swallowing. Which, yeah, I mean, to to a lot of us, that doesn't make any sense, right? But to her, it was a it was a very intense fear. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all of this and dating in your 30s in small town America is super fun. Uh, it's its own separate kind of anxiety hell. Um, going to work or school, attending parties, um, entering a room when somebody's already seated. If you've ever been one of those people or saw one of those people that will like be a couple late, a couple minutes late to college class or whatever, and look through the window and go, nope, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Just turn around, I'm skipping class today, I cannot walk in when everybody's sitting there, because they're all going to turn around and look at me when I open the door. Um, I don't know how many relationships I've ruined because of anxiety and panic attacks. Not just like romantic relationships, but friendships, business relationships, whatever. Um, and... I'll, I'll overinvest myself in any kind of relationship and then push people away because in my head, I've already messed things up a million times. I'm being too needy. I'm not attentive enough. I'm not doing the right things. The list goes on and on. And again, this isn't just me talking. People have different leveling of, different levels of anxiety and deal with different symptoms that they've experienced. But a huge common theme is overthinking and being around people. <clears throat> so next up, super fun one, is bipolar disorder, um, previously known as manic depression. And there's two sides to this one. There's the manic mania part. Um, some of the symptoms are you're ab abnormally, well, during, during the mania part anyways, you're abnormally upbeat and, and friendly, um, jumpy, increased activity, um, uh, you're super energetic. You have an exaggerated self, uh, sense of self well being and like confidence. You're super euphoric. Um, decreased need for sleep, unusual talkativeness, racing thoughts, poor decision making is one that I've, I've definitely had people tell me stories about that have, before they knew they had, uh, b before they knew they were bipolar, they just, people just thought they were being dicks. They were making all of these rash, horrible decisions that would ruin marriages and friendships and, you know, like, I'm not going to work today. I'm going to go on a shopping spree, that kind of stuff. And then the second part is 
um, all of the normal characteristics of depression, so like depression, uh, sorry, depressed mood, um, mark, uh, a marked loss of interest for things that you once cared about, weight gain, sleeping all the time, loss in appetite, all that kind of stuff. Um, fatigue, loss of energy. <laughs> Um, think about planning or attempting suicide, which I hate laughing while I'm saying that part. Um, uh, decreased ability to concentrate, think. Uh, next is borderline personality disorder, which is also called disassociative identity disorder. disorder. That's hard to say. Um, it includes pattern of unstable, intense relationships, distorted self-image, extreme emotions, and impulsiveness. Um, you have an intense fear of, of abandonment, rapid changes in self-identity. Um, you'll shift your goals all the time. You can see yourself as being just the worst person in the world or not existing at all. Uh, shifts between those different personality disorders. Um, so I know I'm going to make a couple a couple references. I already talked about Mr. Robot, but um, does anybody ever read the Dark Tower series? by Stephen King. So they cover that a little bit. Um, there's a character in there that uh, doesn't know about her own personality, her own other personalities. Um, and they do a really good job of explaining the different um, stuff that goes on in, in that kind of uh, disorder. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. There are inappropriate intense anger, losing your temper, having physical fights, um, more impulsive and risky behavior, gambling, reckless driving, unsafe sex, spending sprees, binge eating, drug abuse, all like just all of the things that you probably shouldn't be doing, um, and mood swings. Uh, so here, oh yeah, and the personalities are created um, as a coping mechanism. A lot of times this disorder comes after uh, like in intense like child abuse. Kids will um, create different personalities to kind of cope and deal with that. Um, <clears throat> one of the worst cases of, of child schizophrenia was a seven-year-old little girl named Janie. She was diagnosed in 2009. Um, her hallucinations were in the form of imaginary children and animals. There's uh, there was a little girl named, well, these are her personas that she created. There's a little girl named 24 Hours, a rat named Wednesday, and a cat named 400 that told her to do bad things. And that if she didn't do it, they would scratch her until she died. So over the years, her professor identified more than 200 different animals that that little girl had made up. She was increasingly self-harming already at seven, had attempted suicide several times and was violent to her entire family. They had to do a, her, her mom and dad had to do a 24-hour watch on her in their home because they didn't want to like institutionalize her. They would be up 12 hours a time with her so she was never alone with herself or with her baby brother. So depression, uh, it's one of the most talked about mental health issues out there. Uh, many people with, will associate just being sad um, with depression, but it's way more than that. Um, according to a recent WHO study, depression is the leading cause of physical illness in the world. <sighs> Feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, emptiness hopelessness, angry outbursts, oh, even over small matters, um, loss of interest in things you once loved, like all, all your normal activities that you were, you were doing all the time. Uh, sleep disturbances, including insomnia, insomnia or too much sleep. Uh, lack of energy, uh, changes in appetite, anxiety goes along with depression a lot. Uh, slow thinking, feels, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, and fixating on past failures and blaming yourself even though you're not responsible. You have unexplained physical problems such as back pain and headaches. Like I said, there are definite, definite physical uh, manifestations of a lot of these mental health issues. Next one is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying event. A lot of people will associate this with active military personnel um, that have seen combat. And that happens a lot. A lot of uh, veterans struggle from PTSD. 
Um, it can also happen for other super traumatic events, rape, um, you know, seeing murder, you know, anything like that. Uh, you relive the traumatic event over and over again. Um, you have flashbacks of them, even though you don't want to. Um, upsetting dreams or nightmares, and severe emotional distress or reactions to something that reminds you of the event that had happened. <clears throat> uh, so next is obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, this features a pattern of unreasonable thoughts and fears, which are the obsessions, that lead you to do repetitive behaviors, which are the compulsions. Um, a couple, well, one at least super famous person had OCD fairly bad, uh, Nikola Tesla. He actually uh, would walk around a building three times before entering it. Most things had to be divisible by three. Like he stayed at a hotel. It had, the number room he stayed in had to be divisible by three. Um, he wouldn't eat alone with women. He had an intense fear of women's earrings, um, intense fear of circle-shaped objects, um, which, I mean, he's still pretty successful, but yeah, that, that's definitely one of the most, um, most popular cases of OCD. Another one I found, um, it was a case in the 1800s of a young lady that would wash her hand, hands repetitively, so like 200 times a day, uh, due to fear of con contamination. Um, another lady in the 1800s was obsessed with the idea that she would have an affair. She was happily married, never had thought about having an affair, but that in fear was so compulsive that you could walk up to her and say, you had an affair on your husband, and she would automatically believe you. Um, she even created like a legit chastity belt to give to her husband. Other things are fear of contamination or dirt, um, needing things orderly and symmetrical, aggressive or uh, horrific thoughts about harming yourself or others, unwanted thoughts including aggression um, based on sexual or religious objects. And a lot of people will also associate OCD with like, I like using Excel, or I like my desk neat and untidy. No, it's not the same thing. Um, these are very, very intense to the point where it's, it's messing with your uh, normal and everyday life. So we can all agree that one of these conditions will really suck. Uh, so now what? What if you or someone you care about is experiencing one or more of these? How do you cope or how do you help them cope? Um, a while back I put out a survey on Twitter asking about 20 different questions about mental health and how you feel about mental health. Um, and several of the survey responses are up here for the one question. Uh, the one question was, do you participate in any activities to redu reduce, dull, or improve the stress or feelings you're having, such as alcohol, prescription drugs, other drugs, exercise, medication, or other? This question alone uh, really uh, set me into like a, a panic attack afterwards because I didn't set it to multiple, tr uh, multiple answer. <laughs> People are like, I do all of these. Um, so like I was beating myself over the head because I didn't put out a question correctly. Um, so out of 860 responses, these were the results. The other category, my favorite responses, were uh, pretend to be a Vulcan, masturbation, cats, and Twitter. <laughs> in that order. <laughs> uh, names of those were withheld for privacy, of course. So there are a lot of different coping and relaxing uh, relaxation methods that you can do to help out with this kind of stuff, including medicine, but not always. Um, and you see here the earlier hypothesis at work uh, in, the foods, in the form of booze and drugs. Um, when I started this, I also reached out to a friend of mine who's a mental, a mental health counselor for his day job. And he said the quickest way to improve uh, your brain chemistry is moving around. And he asked me what are the two, uh, the two best ways to improve your brain chemicals without drugs. Anybody know? Exercise. Exercise is one of them. Sex. Sex is the next one. <laughs> but I think only if you're doing it right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I use my mom as a sounding board for a lot of the stuff uh, that I talk about. 
which sometimes is great because I love making her laugh and cringe and shake her head at me. Um, and when I was talking about different coping mechanisms, she actually told me about her grandma who um, during menopause was sent into a mental institution uh, to work with counselors and psychiatrists. And at that time, um, because she was like sad and withdrawn, she had depression. At that time, the treatment was regular shock treatments, um, which we don't have to deal with today unless you choose to. Um, and I mean, it's nothing like trying to cure your depression by shocking the hell out of you. Uh, now we have better options. People talk sarcastically about safe spaces when making fun of millennials. Um, but I think the majority of people don't need safe spaces in, in, the, in the normal thought of how those safe spaces work. But it's nice to have somebody to be able to talk to. Um, hopefully it gets chosen. I put in a, um, uh, a workshop for DerbyCon, if any of you go. Uh, it's going to be like a mental health uh, workshop where we go over exercises and there are, uh, let's just make quiet room, white noise, talks like this, etc. But kind of like that, just like super chill, um, a place that you can talk to people that you trust <clears throat> without being mocked. Um, back then you couldn't really talk about mental health at all, just like you couldn't talk about divorce, teen pregnancy, and yeah, you've had all three. <laughs> so. <laughs> Not can you talk uh, to people in your field about your thoughts. You can talk about talk to psychiatrists, therapists, uh, psychologists, whatever, that not only will listen to you, but will help you through any thoughts that you're having from a professional opinion stance, right? That's what they went to school for. You didn't, well, most of you didn't go to school for psychology. So that's not your forte. Your forte is tech, security, whatever. Um, you know, you wouldn't want the psychologist configuring a, an IDS, so you shouldn't handle your uh, mental health on your own. So back to getting all doped up. Um, the last 20, in the last 20 years, we've seen a 400% increase in the use of antidepressants, um, with an estimated one in 10 adults using them now. Well, we don't want to devalue people's suffering. We don't. All, we also don't want to be quick to throw pills at things. Um, when there's better non-medical things that you may be able to try first, which are free, right? It's great that people are medita uh, med meditating, exercising, eating right, um, learning, and doing whatever to relieve some of the stress. And a, mo a lot of that is because it increases the dopamine levels automatically without the need of anything clinical. <clears throat> um, when I was first prescribed Zoloft, uh, it was the first um, anxiety and a depression method um, medicine that I was on. This is kind of the explanation that was given to me, um, that it's just a simple, a simple chemical reaction in your brain that you can fix with some medication. While I wholeheartedly uh, took that as gospel, as gospel, because logically on the surface that made sense, Something biological isn't quite firing right in my head, and I'm going to put the chemicals I need in my body to try and fix it. Um, during my research, I found out that this isn't necessarily 100% true. Um, what I found in medical journals and articles, they really have no clue why some of this medicine works. <laughs> Which a lot of times, I mean, people will jump back and forth between different, um, different types of medication to try and fix whatever specific issues they're having because it's definitely not a uh, one cure fits all. Which, okay, I get that science is hard. Um, the studies point out issues also arise from faulty mood regulation um, uh, by your brain, genetic vulnerability, stressful life events, medication, medical problems, all that kind of things. Um, and to quote an American Psychological Association article, um, let's see here. We do not dispute the possibility that neurotransmitters and other brain chemicals play a significant role in the etiology of depression. However, we are also concerned that the chemical imbalance explanation may not reflect the full range of causes of depression. It may be given greater credence by both consumers and practitioners than is supported by sound research and or may be understood in an overly simplistic manner. But really, what part of medical science do we not receive in an overly simplistic manner, right? I mean, if you go and you're diagnosed with something, unless you're 
you have a very, very thorough physician, or you're asking a lot of pointed questions, they're going to give you the easiest answer that gets you the information that you need. <coughs> so I started taking Zoloft about six months uh, before the end of my marriage, and it was amazing. I wasn't sad anymore. I had energy. I was just, it was just great. Um, but it also kind of made me a zombie. It was great at propelling me through job change, house move, divorce, um, another job change, uh, because honestly, I didn't have any emotions at all. Um, it was the best thing ever at the time. Um, another uh, uh, pop culture reference, which I, I suck at pop culture references, so I don't know why there's so many in this talk. Um, <laughs> if any of you ever watched The Magicians, there's an episode where they have like, uh, a spell that will put all of their emotions on a little bottle. It's exactly how I felt. Everything was just like dead on the inside, <laughs> which is, I mean, looking back, probably isn't the best way to be. Um, and that's, that's why I ended up going to something else. So, um, oh, da -da -da -da. all right, I'm done with that one. So after the major stresses died down, I switched to something else. Um, I realized it would be kind of nice to feel some sort of emotion again, um, other than trying to fill that hole in me with other very, very non-healthy things. Um, you know, it's, it's always great to self-reflect. Uh, so I changed to Wolbutrin with occasional Xanax, which for me works fantastic, uh, as long as I remember to take them. So I'm not saying that everybody should be medicated, but it worked for me. Um, and I bet you there is a good amount of people that either should be doing that or coping or coping um, in healthier ways than they currently are. So what other coping mechanisms are there to possibly work on? Um, even properly medicated mental health can be a struggle sometimes. Uh, I listened to a podcast called The Hilarious World of Depression. Uh, during one of the episodes, the guest talked about dealing with her anxiety by giving it a name. She called it Steve, and then she imagined Steve as this dumb friend that comes out and gives her shitty life advice all the time. She could just say, Steve, cut it out. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm way smarter than you are. And that helped. That helps a lot of people that I know once they thought, once they figured out like that was a thing. And a lot of um, uh, child counselors will give that as um, something that children can do. Right, they can name it because I mean that's kind of like a fun game that you can play um, to kind of uh, cope with that. Other times, crying, even if I haven't chosen to do it, helps. Uh, I did not really want to give this talk two days ago <laughs> because I uh, was I broke down on because of my knee and I had lack of being able to do things and whatever, just broke down and freaked my kids out and cried on my kitchen floor. But, um, so there's actually a tear expert, which is cool. Uh, he's a biochemist. His name's Dr. William Frey at the Ramsey Medical Center in Minneapolis. He discovered that reflex tears are 98% wa water, so like uh, because of pollen in the air or um, getting like physically hurt, something like that. But emotional tears uh, actually shed hormones and toxins out of your body, which accumulate over time during stress. Additional studies also showed that crying uh, stimulates the production of endorphins, which is our, our body's natural painkiller, and, and feel-good hormones. Uh, crying makes us feel better, even when a problem persists. Uh, in addition to physical detoxification, emotional tears emotional tears heal the heart. You don't want to hold tears back. Um, he said that his patients sometimes say, uh, please excuse me for crying. I was trying hard not to. It makes me feel weak. Definitely been there. Um, I've given this talk three times prior, uh, with different versions of it. And the first time I was scared to death, I was going to cry on stage. Like I, I was looking like Methods to not cry in front of people online. <laughs> I hate crying in front of people. Like one of the tricks, I guess, is you're supposed to tighten your ab muscles to keep yourself from crying. But I feel like that would have bad consequences <laughs> anyways. Uh, so my heart goes out when I hear that kind of stuff. Um, and he talks about how he hates the whole powerful men don't cry uh, and rejects those notions. 
um, the new enlightened um, paradigm, uh, I can't say that word, of what constitutes a powerful man and woman is sometimes who has the strength and self-awareness to cry. So, let's see here. Yeah, here we go. I personally use breathing exercises um, by Neural Beats, which you can find on YouTube and are best with headphones because it's um, it goes, you know, like different things in different ears. And other um, uh, videos made for anxiety on YouTube. Uh, I'll fall asleep to them a lot of times. And there's also a uh, technique called the 54321 coping technique. And I, as I walk through these, feel free to do them um, eat now just to practice if you want or to try something new and humor me. So uh, five is acknowledge five things around you that you can see. However big or small, you just recognize five items you can see with your eyes. Four, acknowledge four things around you that you can touch. Don't go getting all handsy uh, unless it's consensual. <laughs> Maybe it's your computer, the chair you're sitting on, fabric you're wearing, your badge, glasses, cup you're carrying, whatever. Three, acknowledge three things around that you can hear. Air vent, I mean, obviously you can hear me, right? Um, but any other things that you can hear, go outside, see if you can hear birds or traffic or, you know, car going by, anything like that. Um, but listen to like the ambient things you wouldn't normally tune into. Two, acknowledge two things around you that you can smell. I hope you've all had your shower, and it is like the first talk in the con, so you should be fine. Uh, <laughs> so you can see how your neighbor smells. Again, that should be cons consensual. Um, but if you can't automatically sniff something out, go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> maybe not. I was thinking soap, but that might not be a good idea either. Uh, coffee in your cup, the detergent on your clothes, uh, perfume you're wearing, all that. And the last one can two, go two different ways. I've seen um, acknowledging one positive thing around you that you can taste, or acknowledging one positive thing about yourself. Um, considering where we are and the fact that your neighbor not only might not smell good, but they might not taste good either. I don't know why I wrote that in there. <laughs> uh, we'll go with the positive thing. Um, anxiety can leave us feeling inadequate or silly that we're getting worked up over nothing, which happens all the time. Um, but taking time to feel to acknowledge your feelings is also an accomplishment. Um, positive thinking can help bring about positive feeling in yourself. And you can always do that throughout the ex uh, exercise as well. So now we've covered a bunch of my personal baggage and different coping mechanisms. How about we look about how we can treat other people that might be struggling? Our loved ones, family members, coworkers. Um, as I've said before, I've talked to an amazing amount of people since bringing this up and learned a lot about how other people help their loved ones. And I've had a lot of people ask me how they can help their loved ones. Um, not only are there a lot of resources online, which I'll share as well, um, but also I'll tell you a little bit about what you can do to help get them a little bit better. Um, the best thing that you can do is open communication. There are a lot of efforts out there to try and make it so this isn't so stigmatized and people can actually open and openly talk about it without being judged. <clears throat> um, since I try and talk about this stuff openly, got a huge range of responses from people. I can tell now when I have an anxiety attack coming on and I have a handful of people that I can talk to about it. Um, usually when I feel an anxiety attack coming on, I can't talk, so there's like code words I use. Um, I obviously use porcupine because porcupine's my favorite animal. Um, and the two most common negative things I've heard people say or, or have been told before is that they're overreacting is definitely a big one. Um, and I'm not the only one that happens to for sure. I was surprised at how many people told me that that's the response that they get. I get that a lot, uh, especially from my mom. <laughs> uh, and I truly do have so much going on for me. Um, I have a wonderful family, a great career, published author, great group of friends, I'm fairly healthy, <laughs> uh, gainfully employed, how could I be depressed? Um, 
I don't have the right to be depressed. And a lot of people think that. But you know what? I've caught myself saying the exact same thing to people that have told me that they're, that they're depressed. Um, I'll say, but, but you're amazing and we love you. That doesn't, that doesn't help. No, I highlighted the wrong thing. Uh, it was the bottom one. Or two, try thinking happier thoughts. All things that you should not say. I only wish this was possible. Uh, you can't just will yourself to be happy. Uh, you might have a chemical imbalance or other potential reason that your brain is firing a certain way. Um, it's really easy to put the happy face on, on the outside, uh, but that doesn't mean that any of the inside issues go away. <coughs> a good majority of mental health issues come with their own physical symptoms, like well, as we covered earlier. Even if it's difficult for the everyday person to see, sometimes we can't even see it ourselves and we don't attribute those things um, as being connected. Um, and you can't just tell someone to make more of an effort. Not that I only gotten the, the positive and negative stories from people around mental health, um, but almost everyone that I've talked to over the last few years have surprised someone by telling them how they feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, bringing, bringing up your inner demons is never really easy to talk about, uh, no matter how many times you do it. And in a few cases, I've been told um, those people were just shamed into thinking it's their fault, which definitely doesn't help. So th some things that you can say. Um, sometimes you just have to listen. You don't really have to say anything. Um, if it's somebody that you're close to and you care about, you can, you can create signals. Maybe it's like I do and I have the code word, but you have to know what works for that individual person. Um, and it's going to help more than you know. Um, there are a handful of people I can go to, um, that, that I know what to say. A lot of times you don't, just don't know what to say. So it's best just, just to listen. Um, my issues happen a lot uh, after big conferences because I work from home all day. Uh, I'm around my kids and my cat, and I don't ever go anywhere. And then I'll show up and be around hundreds of people with constant human interaction. Bad diet, lack of sleep, I'll forget my meds, and just everything compounds on top of each other. And then I'm, at the end of like two or three days, I just freak out. Um, but now I actually remember and make a concerted effort to remember my medications and my medicine and have been eating healthier, and boy, what a difference it really makes um, when you have some semblance of the routine that you normally have. <clears throat> Secondly, another thing that you have to understand about people, too, is sometimes they just might not feel like going out, so they shouldn't be forced. Um, the thoughts of crowds, enclosed spaces, public restrooms, loud noises, whatever it is that m might cause them issues, um, is not something that they might want to face that day. And I find that true to be no matter the issue. Being crazy really takes a toll on your social life. Uh, and sometimes there's nothing that you can do to help, but that communication is the backbone for all of that. Um, there's a great article a friend sent me, sent to me called This is How You Love Someone with Anxiety. A lot of points were super spot on um, for each of us in different ways, and talking about it was, was interesting to, to see a different person's um, perception on how that stuff works in his life. And I think my favorite quote is still, um, <clears throat> silence kills anyone with anxiety. It creates problems in their mind that aren't even there. It ends in apologies that aren't even needed. That pretty much describes me to a T. Uh, I can make super wild speculations over, oh my god, what did I just send that made them not ever talk to me again? It happens way more than it probably should. Um, and that's 5,000 times worse when I just open up about something, you know, uh, more personal. So even though I suffer from this myself, I still find myself at a loss for words um, when, other, when other people are opening up to me. Um, I try my hardest to remember the things that I should say, and maybe I just say the same like sentence over and over again. I don't know. Um, but the fact that somebody is willing to tell you that kind of stuff um, and trust you with that part of themselves uh, really, really means a lot. Um, it's okay, and how can I help are probably the two most powerful things that you can say. 
And obviously nothing beats a blanket fort. <laughs> Which I might try and actually do if that workshop gets accepted, is have real blanket forts. I don't know if that would go over well or not, or there'd just be 30 sweaty people in a blanket fort. <laughs> um, <laughs> so not as only is it difficult to talk about in the beginning, but other things may come into play that make you want to bottle it up and force it to go away. Um, I want to show you a couple things that our community is already doing. One is ironin.com, which Jason Street started up. It's great for like getting in an info sack and different mental health um, talks and talks on imposter syndrome and a whole bunch of stuff on that site. That's ir0nin.com. Um, also talks about the semicolon project and has a lot of really great resources. And next is this video from Movix, which I hope my sound works. Uh, many, some of you may have seen this before, but it's about hacking together, and it really drives home some of the points I'm trying to make here. All right, here we go. Shoot. <laughs> Anybody know if I can get audio? Oh, was working? Oh, okay. Well, I thought you were just like hearing it from my laptop. All right, here it goes. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rob Fuller, and I'm a hacker. Now, every single one of you watching probably has a different definition of what that might be. But I guarantee not a single one of those definitions includes race, creed, color, religion, sexual preference, or anything in between. The hacker community is filled with human beings, people from all walks of life. In our community, like any social community, there are people among us, friends, acquaintances, con buddies that have problems that many of you might not even know they have. We have lost too many of those friends to suicide, drugs, alcohol, depression, and crime. Many of us dove into the world of computers and the internet because it was a place of acceptance. But there's a dark side to this world. It is too easy to disconnect. To miss those markers when all you see is what someone tweets or IMs. We can't see when you hurt, when you cry. There are many ways to help us that need it and are afraid to ask because one of the biggest biases we still have in our community is showing weakness. But you can let those around you know you care, that you are there for them, and the door is open to talk anytime. But one of the best ways is just to be around each other. Hang out, go to a movie, have a good time, talk about your day. To be a true friend, not just another face in the lobby of a conference. If you wish to join me in this fight, please make a video. Or just tell your friends, your con buddies, or your acquaintances that you just see at that lobby con that we are all hacking together. So I like that. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool video. Um, and I mean, that's coming from a Marine that used to blow up shit for a living. So he can talk about that stuff. So can you. Uh, so let's do some hacking together. My door, my phone, my DM, well, my DMs aren't really open, but I'm on Slack. Uh, <laughs> they're always open to talk about whatever's on your mind. Um, a lot of times if you're feeling lonely or disconnected, or if I'm feeling lonely or disconnected, I'll tweet out like uh, a Google Hangouts link just so I can like talk to people face to face, even if it is over the computer. Um, you can talk about projects that you're working on. My kids will come on and say hi sometimes. Um, I'm... I'm here, I'm out there, and uh, there's a lot of other major nationwide organizations that we can count on as well. Uh, I think the saddest part of the survey results that I sent out was, and this is the part that always makes me cry. <coughs> Have you ever felt like that you weren't worth much as a person? Over 50% of the people said yes. <laughs> And over 40% said that they thought their life wasn't worthwhile. Um, I feel like having more of an open dialogue about this and killing it as taboo uh, will help a long way towards fixing it. <clears throat> I told you I was going to cry instead. <clears throat> Let's be more compassionate to others and work together, um, even if you don't like each other. Life is just a life, as Rob said. Uh, we've already lost too many. The World Health Organization states that over 800,000 people die a year uh, via suicide, and it's the second leading cause of death between people 15 and 29 years old. Um, there are indications that 
for each adult who had died of suicide, there may be other, there may be more than 20 others attempting it. Um, here's some really amazing uh, uh, institutions or, or associations that you can use. Some of them, if, if you don't want to talk to anybody on the phone, like I hate talking to people on the phone, uh, you can chat with online. And they have super compassionate people on the other end of the phone line to talk to. And I like to finish up with uh, a picture of a cute puppy because I know how depressing this talk is. <laughs> so recapping things that you should remember, you're definitely not alone. Two, get help if you need it. There's always options out there. Um, and three, be compassionate to one another and communicate. We've all had our struggles in life, some more than others, but you never know what's going on in someone else's mind. So thank you for listening. I've composed myself. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> All right, I'll be around today and tomorrow if you have any questions.